Welcome to the Sobriety Diaries, friend. My name is Nate. I am a grateful recovering alcoholic and sober coach. My addiction has shaped the person I am today and given me the ability and voice to help others, and I simply wouldn't be here without it. Recovery is possible. The Sobriety Diaries is a video podcast where we share powerful stories of recovery told by those who live them. Head on over to the sobrietydiaries.com where you can apply to be a guest on the show and join our insiders list for exclusive content, early release episodes, and much more. Also, please share this podcast with just one person in your life who may still be struggling. You just never know what they may need to hear today. Before we jump into things today, I wanted to take a moment to thank Exact Nature for partnering with me on today's episode. Exact Nature's safe and healthy CBD-based products are specifically formulated to help you with the challenges of stopping drug and alcohol abuse, like addictive cravings, depression, anxiety, and better sleep. Learn more at exactnature.com. And as a listener of the Sobriety Diaries, use the code TSD20 to receive 20% off of your order at checkout. Again, TSD20 at exactnature.com. Happy Sober Day, friends. Thank you so much for downloading today's episode and spending a part of your day with me here on the Sobriety Diaries. Today is such a special episode, and I finally got to sit down with two new friends of mine, Mercy Lee Bell and Alyssa May Hart. They lovingly refer to themselves as the co-parents of Sober Voices and have put together their second virtual summit uh, entitled Sober Voices Flow. Flow is a four-day virtual event packed with speakers, experiences, and a global lineup of storytellers representing such a diverse perspective on sobriety. Sobriety that is celebrated in the full spectrum, the full kaleidoscope that it deserves. I so relate to Mercy and Alyssa and everyone at Sober Voices in that we share a passion for really normalizing an alcohol-free life. And flow and future events will really highlight that and showcase the beautiful work that they are doing. So let's open the diary on Mercy, Alyssa, and Sober Voices Flow. Alyssa and Mercy, thank you so much for making time for my little old show today. I so appreciate everything that you've done and leading up to kind of exciting week, right? For the two of you. We're gearing up for Sober Voices Flow, kicking off on the 30th. And, you know, Nate, so great, so grateful to have connected with you during the planning of this event and to have you as a speaker there. I'm humbled. And it's kind of interesting how we connected through dash my dog and it's evolved to much more and i'm grateful and honored as i learned more about the event and saw the amazing list of speakers and those who are involved i'm i'm just so grateful that we connected nate i want to echo everything that Alyssa said we feel so special like it's such a special thing to have you involved and we're so grateful dash brought us to you we thought the pandemic would be over I think, can I tell the truth? Like we thought when we were building this event, we could do hybrid. Yeah, We were going to gather across the country, all types of communities in recovery, or even thinking about sobriety, kind of circling that word. What does it mean to reevaluate our relationship with alcohol? And so the original idea for Sober Voices Flow, which is our conference that starts on the 30th of September, was like, What if we could get across the entire country, maybe the world, people in community with each other face-to-face, regardless of their perspective on recovery, a total neutral meeting ground. And we've been doing virtual events, which is incredible. And we're doing a fully virtual event, which I am super excited about. But I wanna share the evolution was like, in that moment of optimism, does anybody remember like that little moment? We had like a month. Yes. Where we thought by this time we'd all be like hanging out again unmasked maybe because yeah, we're vaccinated yeah. 
So the evolution has been really embracing virtual and understanding it's going to be here for maybe a very long time. And if it is, how do we turn an event that is going to be two-dimensional, make it feel 3D, make it feel in person and make it feel embodied, like you're actually living it rather than just watching it. Mm. And um, yeah, that's the journey we're on. And that's what we hope we've created for folks who are coming next week. Fingers crossed for next year's uh, event. I would like to throw my card into the hat and love to be involved and help in any way that I can. Yes. Alyssa, do you want to talk about the co-organizer model that we try, tried out this year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the talking about evolution, this is our second virtual event. And when, after the first one, when we started thinking about like ideas, one thing was certain is that we can't do everything ourselves just the two of us. Like, I don't know if a lot of people know that we're the, like technically the sober voices team is Marcy and I, yes. <laughs> um, we both quit our jobs earlier this year to be all in this. Um, but it also shouldn't just be us. And so that was one of the biggest differences for this event was bringing on co-organizers and like really giving them ownership and compensating them to put sessions together that are for and by communities that they belong to. Mm. And, you know, while I'm very proud of the first event that Sober Voices put on in early February, you know, there's only, only, only one way to go is up and to continue to evolve and grow. And there's, you know, we would like to consider like 80, 80 plus speakers. I think we're at 81 speakers, 61 sessions. It's very expansive, but we're not going to hit every group and we're not going to represent everyone's story, but we can do our best. And one of the best ways to do that is by bringing on other people into this community. So we have... Um, three co-organizers that uh, we're so proud of that put on um, and organized some really amazing sessions this time around. It's interesting to the words that we choose to identify with. And mm -hmm. I think you guys do a very good job of talking about the spectrum of recovery and or the spectrum of living an alcohol-free life. And I think with a lot of things society has made us um, identify ourselves in some way, whether it's an alcoholic, a recovering alcoholic. And I identify or did as a recovering alcoholic. And some people that were willing to come on the show said, I don't identify as an alcoholic. Is that okay? And I said, absolutely. I want to tell as many stories as possible. Um, I want to just quickly, something you said yeah. really hit me. And it's never hit me before because we actually use the word spectrum quite a bit, um, I think, in some of our about pages. Mm. And for the first time, when you said the word spectrum, it I felt like a little resistance. And it wasn't that it's not a spectrum, but it's even more complex than a spectrum, this word sober. It's like a kaleidoscope. Mm. You know, a spectrum's a gradient. It goes from one side to the other. It's one dimensional in a way. And when we started talking to people about what the word recovery meant, what it meant to heal, what sober as a term means, sober curious, we really had an explosion of perspectives like a kaleidoscope. If you remember those, um, like that thing you could put on your eyes and you kind of roll the dial and just the shapes would change and merge in the colors. That's how it feels to us. And so even with a spectrum of good, bad, worse, better, it is almost like doesn't give us full credit for just how inventive and creative human beings are at creating their own healing journeys. And we have really made a point of saying sober voices has no opinion, not even on the word sober, not even on the idea of recovery. We don't know about the how we do care about the many reasons for why. And we love for people to share the what, what they've done, what's in their lived experience, but not from that expert point of view, more like just a celebration of just how incredibly unique and individual the journey is. I, I guess, have always thought of a spectrum as sort of the largest collection of possibilities, but it truly is a linear, mm -hmm. it, it is linear. And I think that kaleidoscope just opens it up even that much more. I love that. I spend my days on and off with Mercy on Zoom, on Zoom calls and video calls, and I still get goosebumps. <laughs> but that metaphor is so, it's, I don't know if potent's the right word, but yeah. when I think about like the gifts that so my sobriety has given me 
and you know, we'll, we can get into our stories later, but I don't, I didn't identify as being in recovery for years on really until this year, just because I don't, I don't consider myself an alcoholic. I found sobriety throughout of al but it is really a kaleidoscope because the longer you get and the further along in your own recovery, you are, it is just like an opening up of new, of new things, good and bad for you to look at. And your, your opinions and your beliefs do continue to change too, especially as like, you know, new ideas come to you. And that's one thing that sober Instagram is really good for is also limited at, you know, we're still in like these echo chambers, but Mm. that kaleidoscope is it's really spot on. Well, in keeping with the sobriety diaries theme, uh, (laughs) I would like to hear a bit of each of your stories and how they led to the creation and uh, the evolution as we see it today. Whoever wants to go first. Not it. <laughs> I just touched on mine, so I'm happy to go first. For starters, I just, I had four years, my four years was at the end of July. And thank you very much. I'm very proud. Yes. Um, that's such a long amount of time. Um, and I found sobriety really throughout of Al-Anon. But, um, you know, going back, I, I grew up in an environment where, um, I had put myself in the position in in my own family dynamics to be the one with, you know, we had two people who struggled with alcohol use in my immediate family, one of my parents and a sibling. And I was in the position or put myself in that position of being the peacekeeper, the person who felt like I could change outcomes for these two people if I just showed up enough, loved hard enough. And considering that never worked out, it was just something that weighed, weighed and weighed and weighed on me over years. And not until I moved across the country from my family did I finally have the emotional space to walk into an Al-Anon meeting and have that like collective moment of like emotional purge that I'm sure many people are familiar with the first time they enter a space like that. And at the same time as going into this, going into Al-Anon and starting to unpack my own family history with alcohol and how it, you know, never been a positive thing in my life. I was living in a new city where I didn't know anyone and I was going out drinking more than I had in years. And about six months in, these two things really just crashed together. Um, Spending a lot of time, money and energy on going out and drinking. And that's not why I had made this huge move and left where I'm from for the first time in my life. And also realizing fully that alcohol had never been a positive thing for me. It had limited the potential of two people I care about the most in my life and unpacking issues with like boundaries and codependency. And at a certain point, I just came to this realization that I had to release any control I had over their outcomes and all I could do was control myself. And so I decided to quit drinking for 40 days and sign up for something called the Mantra Project. And they sent like an email each day, something for you to kind of noodle on. And I got to 40 days and I decided to go for a hundred days and that now it's been over four years. Um, <laughs> and that journey's continued to evolve too. You know, I was just talking to Mercy about this yesterday, entering sobriety. And at this time, like I wasn't in sober Instagram. I had almost no sober people in my life. All I did was remove the alcohol. I didn't do anything else. Like I didn't replace that time or space with like new coping skills or self-reflection even. (laughs) And so that year mark came and I was just more like lazy and anxious than I'd ever been in my life. (laughs) And, um, whereas I had other people I'd met who had gotten sober, who had like, you know, started going to, you know, therapy or AA or other things and working out and were just like this glowing version of themselves. And I was like, I want that. I need that. (laughs) So that for me was a realization of, you know, whatever your reason is for making this choice you still have a lot of the same work and like inventory and reflection to do getting us to, you know, where we are today, you know, before the pandemic, I was working in real life events in the event scene here in Austin, like on things like Austin city limits and South by Southwest. And when that all came to a screeching halt, it became clear to me that while sober Instagram as a consumer of it was a very positive place, it was incredibly limited in representation. (laughs) And I say that as a white woman, and it was so easy for me when I was considering to quit drinking, it was so easy for me to find like white women I could relate to on Instagram. It's true. It's true. There's a lot of them. And 
So thinking about like the genesis of this event was really thinking about, or Sober Voices was thinking about what would it look like to convene outside of this platform and actually give space and voice to people who might not get it otherwise, where people can actually show up and sort of like democratize it somewhat. Mm. And the motivation for me, it's, you know, I'm still in this place where it's a constant struggle with these two people in my family who aren't sober still of, you know, what can I do, which is just focus on my own journey and hopefully make a positive difference to someone else who actually wants it. I do want to touch on this idea of like a non-drinking challenge or Mm -hmm. dry July or so many of these other things that we see, you know, while it can be a great kickoff or Mm -hmm. motivator to remove alcohol from your life, I think the bigger picture is to realize what changes it has Mm -hmm. brought about in your life. So we do this 30 days, 40 days. And at the end of it, I think to truly realize the, the benefits or the changes in your life because of no alcohol, I think is the most important thing. And whether it's weight loss, it's financial, it is, you know, the, the fog has lifted from, Mm -hmm. from your head. Do you remember realizing specific benefits to to those 40 days without alcohol? Absolutely. I think the gift of these challenges is the gift of awareness. So I've gotten, I've received this question from, you know, people who are sober curious so many times, like if I have tips and usually I just say, just set a finite amount of time that you just want to eliminate it and just observe your life and everything around you, all the people around you, how you're feeling, And I think, you know, going back to the kaleidoscope, that it's really the gift of truly seeing yourself and the world that you're in. Including not being able to stop drinking. Because I really want to point out with these challenges, like one of the points of awareness might be, wow, I consciously do not want to drink. And yet I have found myself drinking throughout this period of time. And without judgment or even applying a label, to me, that is like, that is a big, big moment because I remember making those pledges to myself so many times, so many times. I have a really strong memory that Alyssa, what you just shared brought up for me, which was, I was in San Francisco, I was like 23, 24, and I'd been working at a conference. It was like a big technology conference. I had like my business lady outfit on. I was like high heeled shoes, (laughs) a alcohol or spirits company had kind of bought out like a portion of the space and had like a whiskey lounge in the middle of this business conference. And I was running the booth for three days. So I'd like teeter over in my heels. I drink, I'd laugh. And by day three, you know, like the physical bender. I mean, I was so tired. I was showing up every day at 5 a.m. I was drinking all throughout the day and sitting at this booth. And I remember at the very end of that conference, as I was teetering out, Um, I remember feeling blood running down my heel and I remember looking down and realizing that I had all these blisters that had formed on my feet, but probably because I was drinking, I couldn't feel them. And I remember thinking to myself how important it was to go home and get some rest. I remember like consciously being like, I'm in pain and it's time to go home. And someone came up to me in that moment as I was outside the conference and they invited me onto a has anyone ever been on a party trolley? Is this a San Francisco thing? No, I've been. Okay. Yeah. Alyssa, this is like a super, this is Bay Area. This is mm-hmm. like, imagine a trolley car that's souped out. Like, like it looks like a pimp my ride kind of thing. <laughs> We've got like a high, like really nice, like high shelf liquor in the back and the lights are going and the music's pumping and people are in there. Some of them are good looking. And, you know, he invites me on to this party trolley to celebrate the end of the conference. And even though I can feel the blood trickling down my feet, and even though I feel the blisters, and even though I'm exhausted, and even though I'm starting to feel that shame too, you know, that creeps in for some of us, I felt myself like an invisible thread, as if when he had asked me, he had actually tied this invisible lasso around my waist. I felt myself being pulled onto that trolley. And I drank that entire night until 4 a.m. I woke up with someone I did not know. Uh, and for some reason, this was what I described sometimes as my, my quote unquote bottom. I woke up next to someone who was like an absent father, like his kids called three times and he didn't pick up for them, which to me is like, you know, Satan, absent father, same thing. <laughs> um, and I just remember waking up the next day and saying, wow, like this is my experience is that I have no choice. 
I can't do drinking challenges. I mean, you know, no drinking challenges. I don't, this is not my world because it was the first time I had realized I didn't want to drink and I had still drink. And that had never felt, it had never felt that way to me before until that moment. That was my big wake up. Mm -hmm. um, so partially why when I saw Alyssa and um, I, I, I've heard about people who just say they're going to stop drinking and stop drinking. I'm like, what planet did you come I'm from? Baffled. Like, you're I'm baffled. Like, you're like beautiful aliens that I want to like, I want to join your civilization. But what I really know is that if we think about the kaleidoscope, you know, of like how we recover or how we recover, it's different things for different people, white light experiences, spiritual awakenings, straight up science, CBT, doing a challenge one day, finding out life gets better. There's a million and one ways. I just, for me, I just remember thinking when I saw those dry Januaries, how do people do it? I had to go to an inpatient treatment program because I knew I've always lived alone and mercy to your point that I, as many times as I tried or wanted to in my mind, couldn't do it by myself. There were times where I just wanted to quit so bad, but I physically couldn't. So all of the kudos to folks who just decide to quit drinking and do it. Life didn't get immediately better because mm -hmm. you took away alcohol. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all I was going to add was, you know, doing work in this space and the recovery sobriety space and, and hearing and sharing people's stories. It's something I want to, I'm consciously reminding and aware of that this is life or death for some people. It was not for me. And that's, that's sort of a privilege in itself. And so, you know, while we all seek to continue to grow this community and make it more accessible, I think it's the goal is to make it so that anyone who does need life-saving help is immediately entering a space where they are like welcomed and not feeling so othered. It's not just to make it look like sunshine and rainbows and like an easy choice for some people. I don't know. I sometimes think everyone, we talk about the everyone in recovery thing and it can mm -hmm. sound kind of lame, but it's also just so true. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have yet to meet someone who doesn't have a complicated relationship I would go so far as to say with a substance or an idea, like if it's not sugar, it's gambling of some sort, which could just be like risk-taking behavior when you go hiking by yourself for three days, or it could be like the way you take on jobs that like are adrenaline pumping, or maybe, you know, for someone else, there's something related to codependency or relationships, sex and love. I mean, it's like, there's an infinite video game, social media. Does anyone else get dopamine hits and have crashes from Instagram? Or is it just me? Like, I'm fairly certain we all have something going on at the neurochemical level that is like addiction. And I don't mean to say that everyone is addicted, but just that that experience of the highs and the lows is human. And I do think everyone could identify as in recovery if they're trying to find a way to not live in a high and low and or live in a way where they don't have choices and they can't see the outcomes that they want. You said something that just hit different today and is that that risk taking or that risky behavior. I felt that for a long time and, and it's still something that I have to work on that like addiction to risky behavior or like a question mark as to what the outcome will be. I like to use the term character opportunities. Like I have an opportunity <laughs> to work on this particular aspect of myself or my behaviors. Uh, and that is still a character opportunity that I have. I love it. I, I too agree. Sometimes the language in recovery can feel pop to me, either overly positive or yeah. overly negative. Yeah. And what I've done is, I don't know if this is supportive for anyone who's listening, but I just, this helped me a lot. I try to read the etymology. This is so embarrassingly nerdy. No I problem. go to the, I go to the dictionary and I go to the root of the word because I know human beings do something funny with language. We, we attach meaning onto it, but it had a root and defect it's root is desertion or revolt or rebellion. And that's how I think about my character, quote unquote, defects, is where do I leave myself and where do I truly like, um, like leave myself or, or rebel against who I actually am? Hmm. Because my controlling behavior, my anger, my perfectionism, um, like my passive aggression, my withholding of love to punish so as to control, so as to not be abandoned. All of that isn't who I actually am. I'm deserting myself and probably others in the meantime. I'm revolting against who I really am. 
And so I like that. I like that language. I've learned to love language of shame because I know that there's a root there that isn't. It's curiosity. Huh, why did I leave myself in that situation? Mm -hmm. Why the hell would I have done that? And not from shame or blame, but like pure curiosity. Why the hell did I call my mother every single day of college to see if she was like doing okay? Like what was that controlling really about, right? Mm. So like Alyssa, I share, you know, that I, I grew up in a family where the idea of recovery would be very interesting to Little Mercy, like this idea of human being, adults, present, accounted for, emotionally, and maybe even spiritually available. And, you know, that wasn't always the case, but I'm really lucky to be able to say that in my small family, every single person is in recovery. And um, that's like, that's incredibly rare. And it's part of the reason why when I went to college, you know, I had never, I, I had a really clean act. I was getting good grades and I was really focused on achievement because I was just really trying to be as different for my family as I could. And when I say achievement, I just mean box checking. I have learned that achievement is like how you, you know, help people and support them over time. And my family's done that, helped and helped and inspired a lot of people. But in my little brain, it was all about box checking, getting the degree and getting the job and getting the money and getting the house. By the time I was 24, I had bought a house and I had a great job. And on the outside, things looked pretty good. But I always describe the sensation of um, just internally collapsing. And I remember being um, certain, certain after that bottom I mentioned that I probably was not a heavy drinker or just going through something. I was like pretty sure I was one of us. And if you know what that means, you know what that means. And I don't even care about labels. You can call me whatever, a person who drank too much, alcoholic, addict, person recovery, dignified woman, walking her healing path. Like it all works for me. Cause like I mentioned, I take a label and I'll give it the meaning I want it to have. And that's mm. it. That's the new meaning of it. No one controls my definitions. And I hope for everyone else that they get definitions that work for them. All of it to say that when I went into recovery, um, I did it really, really superficially the first few years, but one of our speakers from flow might call spiritual bypassing. I did the yoga teacher training. I got so hot in my opinion. I mean, I was like working out <laughs> because I wasn't drinking. My skin was glowing. Yeah. I was like dating cuties. So I was like always, you know, like I was just like feeling so cute. And then what Alyssa described about the vacuum, like what happens when I don't put anything in to replace the alcohol, when the relationships end, when the yoga teacher training ends, like, what do I do? And I found myself really in like one of the worst emotional relapses of my life and my mental health issues and all the things that I wasn't willing to look at that I drank over. Um, they all kind of came to the surface. And when I entered recovery, I've always taken an abstinence only approach because it's worked for me. I, I don't tell people it's right. I just know it was right for me and it continues to be right for me. And it continues to be true. I don't drink non-alcoholic beer and it continues to be true that I don't use substances that alter my mood other than caffeine. And I don't believe for a second that my way is right. Just wanted to like quadruple underline that. Yeah. But I also, it's to me, here's how I see it. And this is the last thing I want to share about my story of like drinking and recovery is if I knew how I drank was like a hurricane and one of those hurricanes that's like category five, like knock down all the buildings, like water everywhere, all your photo albums are ruined. If that's how my drinking is for my life. If you told me there was a 10% chance that a hurricane of that magnitude would come to me if I tried to drink again. So even if 90%, I could probably drink a little 10% chance. I go right back to where I was like, I would just never ever not evacuate. I would always take that hurricane warning. I will never drink again, right? I will not play with that part of my brain. Because even if it's a small chance the hurricane comes back, that's all I need to avoid it. And um, I was a violent drinker. And I want people to know that a lot of women don't talk about this and there's a lot of shame, but like some of us, when we drink are Jekyll and Hyde. And I was one of those Jekyll and Hyde drinkers. I am convinced if I didn't pass from my drinking, that someone, someone in my vicinity, something bad would have happened to them physically. And I just, it is so important to talk about what drinking looks like 
it isn't always just falling down or being sad. It can be externalized anger. It can be absolutely dangerous drinking and driving. And all of that, me sharing about it is because it's part of my healing. Um, and it's also okay if that's what it was like for you when you drink. Um, not that the behavior is acceptable, but that can be a part of a recovery story. You said something that I think is so important. And actually TJ and I s spoke a lot about it in, in our session. And that is alcohol worked for me for a long time. There was this need for, for me to silence mm -hmm. the shame that I was feeling and to, you know, fill myself with anything that allowed me to interact with other people and interact with life, really. And alcohol did that for me for a while, you know, until it didn't and until I took it to the next level. And when I quit drinking, I had to find ways to replace that, what alcohol did for me. How am I, as a 32-year-old man at the time who really knew nothing about myself, knew, didn't have any interests, didn't understand how I fit in the world without the only coping mechanism that I knew, you know, how, how do I survive? So speaking of my session, <laughs> yeah, speaking with, of. with TJ Woodward, we talk about so, so much based on my story and TJ's story, but I think a lot of stuff that is universal in addiction and more importantly, recovery. You know, TJ is an addiction and recovery specialist. He brings so much knowledge to the table and really got me in a place where I was emotional at times and it's educational at times. And hopefully at least it, it, it fits in such a diverse group of speakers. And you mentioned this earlier, I think Alyssa said that, you know, while you, you try to diversify the list of speakers, presenters, sessions that you provide, I think it's, it, it's impossible to, to hit on every single uh, demographic or every single person that will tune in. But I think you guys have, have come pretty damn close uh, and have done a pretty damn good job of, of diversifying. And, you know, there's really something for everybody. And, you know, when you talk about that, it's, it's not even about checking boxes and, and, you know, a lot of like corporate spaces, we talk about DE and I now, like that's, yeah. it's so superficial, really like the intent is all of us know whether it's like through someone we care about or ourselves that seeing your story represented is can be life saving, and so really the idea or the goal is hopefully for each of those sessions that is what someone needs at that moment at this moment next weekend and through October, you know to find one thing that resonates with them, or that makes them feel seen or like seen even superficially, yeah. too, yeah. I love Nate, your session with TJ for so many reasons, but one of them is it's a format that was really important for us to highlight, which is like an intimate conversation between two human beings. And, you know, the summit for those who attended the first event, it was a lot of solo storytelling and presentations. And this event, one aspect of that idea of diversity or of representing many is many formats for the sessions. So we call everybody our speakers, but we have, you know, pre-recorded combos that people can chat um, in Q&A live. There's workshops. So truly kind of back and forth with um, a presenter or workshop facilitator. There are breakout rooms where you can just hang out with other attendees, sometimes around a topic like nicotine. Nate, you will definitely be there Ooh, with me, I hope. I'll be there. Just thinking about it made my mouth salivate. Um, I know. I'm on, uh, I, how, honestly, harder yeah. than alcohol. Harder. I mean, I say this, I don't say it often, but yes, absolutely. 100%. I have friends who have, you know, quit everything, including something like heroin, like, or, or yeah. a really highly, highly, highly addictive from the get-go substance who have said that nicotine is the most, it, it's, 
the hardest. I mean, there's a reason it's a bazillion dollar industry, right. that and vaping. Anyway, um, right. I digress. I wanted to share that, you know, the topics are, they're ranging and the formats range. So solo storytelling, you know, grouped conversations, breakout rooms, and then like straight up, like, how about a workout? You know, yeah. how about we get in our bodies and sweat? I won't be there. No, just joking. I'll be there. I'll be <laughs> there. I'm obsessed with this. Um, this we have the most amazing workout and mindfulness and meditation yes. instructors. I mean, it's... all the way to the reason that we initially connected. Pets. Mm. <laughs> we need Dash there. Of and course, you. he's mm -hmm. ready. I want to add to that too. You know, looking at this event and trying to do things a little differently. We also released this idea of having like even keynote speakers really, or highlighting like one session is the session to go to that event that day. And then the other, the other really cool type of session we've done, and, and we don't, we, we don't like the word panel, but it is the best describer sometimes Yeah. of just, um, spaces that have been created where we just put people in a room and just see what happens and, you know, have one person kind of shepherding that process, but like conversations that. like brothers in recovery, that's just, you know, five African-American men in a room together. And, you know, we're going to have live chat, but they're it's live, but they're literally going to feel like they're in a room, just all of them. And, um, sober and Brown, we have two led by Nikita Mehta, one of our organizers. Yeah. Trying to turn this idea of the conference on its head, like that you should just sit there and binge content and it should all be cerebral and invite people in for very specific, um, moments between human beings, because we know in the specific there is universal. Yeah. Initially I was questioning whether or not the format in which TJ and I podcast recording, but unlike any podcast rec recording that I've ever been a part of. So I think the fact that it came out so conversational style and, and to your point, I think it, it, it just fits in perfectly. You know, we were, we were texting that day and it just so happened that I was recording with TJ the day that we initially connected. Ooh, and I was like, goosebumps, goosebumps. wait a second, this might actually work. What do you think about this? And I mean, the, the ball just started rolling and TJ was like, absolutely. I want to be a part. So, you know, it, happened exactly as it was supposed to happen i think as and as that's we know. flow so yeah. that is flow what you described it was the intention set for this conference was that it would feel like flow state when you're in it and it would feel like it when we built it that like amazing serendipitous connections would be made uh, made and that things would just happen as they were we were going to let them just happen and go with the flow um as a virgo this has been hard for me, but <laughs> the gifts, oh my goodness, Alyssa, do you have any magic moments in creating this? I mean, Nate meeting you and you recording TJ is absolutely one of them. I'm just thinking about any other just sort of like magic moments for you. I think the biggest gift for the, for the whole month of July, we were completely focused on building out all of the sessions. And so it was just our, those four weeks were just like back to back zoom meetings with speakers. And I did not handle that part of the process for the first event. Like I didn't get that human connection. And there were calls where we met people and we would get off the zoom and we would just be like in tears mm -hmm. over just the opportunity to even like talk to these people, let alone to work with them and provide any type of platform. And I don't say that to like pat ourselves on the back, but like, let's get one person who needs to hear this. Like, let's get them to this session. Um, so that was really the thing that hit most for me. And it's what we've been deeply rooted in the whole time is just the, uh, the gratitude and working with these, working with these speakers. I'm so excited for, for you guys. And I can tell the hard work that's been put into it. And uh, I'm very excited to, to take part and see how everything sort of rolls out next weekend. Thank you so much for having us, Nate. We're such a, such big fans and we're so glad to be on this with you and to see your wall again, which is just like, if, and I'm glad it's a visual podcast because yeah. this is maybe my favorite wall. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, you heard it here, folks, straight from Mercy's <laughs> mouth. This is actually new because I changed my graphic and I changed my logo. The new website rolls out in three days. The timing I actually worked on the timing so that it would be with flow because that episode will be airing and you know 
being a part of just the specifically with flow being part of such a, a diverse group of people and the podcast and my brand and like the focus of really my like life's work and in my passion you guys reached out to me you guys have been um a bigger part of my path than i think that you realize so just a lot of gratitude to to the two of you and i thank you a lot for that we receive that we feel that it's an honor to be like a part of the journey and the evolution of, of what you're building and truly the way we found you was just that same like surrender of like we there are voices we need like gods of the algorithm like instagram yeah. show us and it was like you like a curtain appeared and there you were so i love this type of um gratitude because to me it's the gratitude to the big mystery of life how do yes. we find each yes. other how do we like how do these signs show up like this is miraculous to me at the very least it's just cool yeah and yeah. you know if if all flow could be and all that sober voices could be as would be a series of happy coincidences it would be meaningful to me and and if it was something more like a grand design how cool yeah. but i'm down with either way it is a gift to know you, Nate, truly. Ditto. And I truly mean when I say, like, please, let's keep in touch, support each other's journey. And I'm absolutely down for, for whatever. And I hope that we can continue this journey together. Us too. Thank you so much. Thank you for the trust. And yes, I'm, I'm receiving as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to carry us through this conversation is going to carry us through like the next couple of days i hope you realize <laughs> hell week <laughs> uh, there you go <laughs> Alyssa and mercy thank you so much for your time good luck on the coming week and i know everything will flow just how it's supposed to thank you Thanks. Good night. talk soon talk soon bye 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 Thanks so much for listening today, friends. Huge thank you to Lissa and Mercy. Make sure that you get your tickets and check out Sober Voices Flow starting this Thursday, September 30th. And with your tickets, you can access it for the entire month of October. Hopefully you heard something in their story that resonates with you. And if we help just one person, our job is done. You can find all things podcast related and subscribe to our show at the sobrietydiaries.com, youtube.com slash Nate Kelly, where we upload today's video podcast and on Instagram at the sobriety diaries pod. Check back soon for new episodes with new stories to tell, but until then try your best not to drink and be good to yourself. Bye friends. <laughs>